Great to, great to hear you and see you again. Thank you. For Good to be seen. Thank you for coming through. Appreciate you. Uh, there's so much going on in the world uh, today, and I'm on this journey. I was just <sighs> so it's been like a world days just where I'm in. I'm in a period of obedience and stillness. Mm. And you know, as I'm looking forward to uh, 2023, which is weird. You know, these years are just piling up. I'm like. I want, I'm setting and framing my life a certain way and I'm going to share it with the audience. So I'm, I'm doing these daily walks and I'm listening to all of these books and, uh, on through audible. And I was, you know, wondering how, as I'm reading grocery shopping with my mother, by the way, um, masterful oh, wow. I'm sitting, I'm going through, uh, and I'm actually going to ask you if I can borrow a stanza for a book project that I'm working on because it was just, yeah. I'm yeah. like, okay, thank you. Cause you know, you gotta get permission or you can only use three lines, you know, uh, before you get sued. I don't want to get sued by nobody. No, I'm not suing you. No, All right, appreciate it. Um, but I was like, this ode to your mother is raw. It's mm. gritty. It's powerful. It's honest in a way that I expect from you. But I was just like, man, you you did the damn thing. So... Before we get into these other topics, um, you, you said during the pandemic, you, you had these thoughts, a lot of these poems in this book were, you know, you borrowed from before, but this particular um, ode, I feel like it's an ode to your mom, came out of your experience now being a caretaker. Yes. And I think about this as people are listening, many of us are uh, evolving into these roles of from being parented to now being parents to our parents or being being caretakers and and there was a a, a a phrase where you talked about you know you holding her the way she must you looked into her eyes the way she must have looked into your eyes as a baby and i was like oh yeah who that that flip that flip um and never saying i love you never not liking to be touched and all of the things you think of mothering and you've talked about this in other books but the way so so talk about this grocery well, shop grocery shopping with my mother first of all thank you so much um just for the opportunity uh it's, th it's 36 poems only four are actually old poems I crashed a lot of the poems in the last two or three years honestly um had a lot on my mind and I hadn't this is my first poetry book this is my 15th book but my first poetry book Karen in 14 years I had literally had walked away from poetry which I regret now because I was like man I missed it so much um life happens you know but uh my mother got sick, you know, we, as you said it, a lot of us, we, you know, people have lost their fathers, their mothers, other elders in their family. And um, you do become at a certain point, like the parent, the caretaker. And it was, it was, and I'm an only child, you know, as I've talked about on the show before with you. And so the whole mental health component of that and trying to deal with the fact that I'm going to have to carry the weight of this by myself, you know, um, my mother and my aunt, uh, both are in Jersey city, my hometown, my home state, as you know, uh, uh, but my mother got sick. You know, and as I talk about in the in the title poem, you know, the most shocking thing for me was going to the hospital. You know, I had gotten a call and I had to rush to Jersey to the hospital and just seeing her laying on a table, and, you know, and I was crying profusely because you don't, you know, you hear these stories of people who just lost their mothers and fathers. I'm trying not to get emotional talking about it, but it's just, it's difficult. But also what it unveils is just the complications of our relationships. My mother came from... Um, James Baldwin to call it Karen is, you know, the old world, the old country, you know what I mean? Some of us may have family from the South or the Caribbean or Latin America or Asia, wherever our parents came from, our grandparents came from. And so they had their culture. And in my mother's, where she came from, her environment, immediate environment, there was no, I love you. There was no hugging and kissing was none of that. You know, you knew the fa family cared because they raised you. That was just pretty the basics, you know what I'm saying? And so she literally packed that up and brought that to New Jersey where I was born and raised. And meanwhile, you know, I'm a, sensitive child I, I realized I mean I'm an artist obviously I didn't know I was an artist as a kid but I've always been someone who was like you know well I would like to hear some expressions of this you know what I mean do you really love me boy don't ask me them fool questions you know what I'm saying Karen we ain't gonna talk about that a lot of the stuff that I believe is it goes back to how we were treated on those plantations during slavery you just couldn't show certain kinds of energies you know you weren't allowed to express yourself in certain kind of ways certain things you just didn't talk about and so that was a big part of my upbringing but my mama didn't realize when she gave birth to me, she was giving birth to a writer, to a poet who's going to write about everything and talk about everything. And, you know, and so it's a love poem to her. You know, I thought about when I wrote the title poem, I thought a lot about how Alice Walker wrote 
uh, uh, the color purple and, and it was Dear God. And so I thought about that. That's where that mm -hmm. came from. I thought a lot about um, how much Whoopi Goldberg means to my mother as a dark skinned black woman. And, and can, when can I, I read like, that? Can I read yeah. that? Yeah, please. Oh, maybe you should read it. I believe my mother loves Whoopi Goldberg. Oh, God. Let me find the page real quick. Hold on. Page 10. I, I, I had a feeling you, you said page 10. I think it's page 10. Yeah. I had a feeling you were going to ask me to um, read something. I had the book. Well, I'd rather you read it because I'm, you know, I don't want to mess up your your good your good writing with, with my with my malaprops and mispronunciations. <laughs> well, it's it, the poem is called "Grocery Shopping with My Mother," and the lines go: "Ma ain't know nothing about no sexism or no classism. Ma ain't know nothing about bell hooks or Toni Morrison or Alice Walker, but she knew she was Sealy before Sealy was Sealy in the color purple." This God is why, to this day, I believe my mother loves Whoopi Goldberg, because when Ma sees Whoopi in the movies, she sees herself crashing through the broken glass of a dream deferred. And then you go on, you know, um, to talk about this God is why Black people got therapy sessions. Oh. We name field hollers, spirituals, the Underground Railroad, the blues, jazz, church, dance, the Chitlin Circuit, prayer circles, funk, hip hop, Holy Ghost, barbershops. Oh my God, I was like, Shh, damn. And I, I never thought about that as our therapy, but you know, when we say we don't have therapy, we absolutely find them in barbershops and beauty parlors. We find them in churches and, and dance halls. We find them in the places where we feel most comfortable, which is why it's important that we, you know, embrace those things and not, you know, and go seek therapy, like licensed therapy. But this, this has been our coping. Karen Hunter show. We find it in the Karen Hunter show. I'm gonna tell you sister, last time I was on the show, I think I hung out with you for two or however long it was, it was a couple of hours. It felt like I have, I got so many incredible messages about what a healing space this show is for people. And so we find it in radio personnel, radio hosts, people who are media folks like yourself who've said, I'm going to create this platform for people because we need this. And not everybody's going to go to therapy the way I might go, or you might go folks still the stigmas around it. You might not feel comfortable talking to a stranger, but if you feel like you have something in common with people, like what you've created as a platform, that's a healing circle. That's a healing story. That's no different than the older woman in that scene in Beloved, Toni Morrison's Beloved, where the people are just congregating around her. They're healing. They're healing. That's what you represent. And, you know, um, my mama, you know, God bless her. Um, it's, it's tragic what racism and sexism together have done to Black women in this country and on this planet, as you well know. It's tragic if people are not able to get formal educations, able to process certain things. You know, I think my mother's one of the most intelligent people I've ever met in my life, but because her education was snatched from her because of segregation, because, you know, uh, only the boy, her youngest brother was allowed to finish high school. And all the girls had to just go work and be the help, et cetera. It, 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 it unwittingly, uh, it, it, it narrowed her way of seeing the world. And so that's what I was born into. But my mother didn't realize that she actually was a visionary because it's because of her that I started reading at an early age. And it was because of her, I went to a library and fell in love with books. It's because of her that I became a writer because she's the first storyteller I ever met. And so I feel that part of my responsibility as a writer, as a Black writer, is to take the stories that I hear, including my own family, and do it with love. You know, yes, it's raw. Yes, it's honest. But the thing that I've been very conscious of, and this is where my own therapy and, and, and spiritual work has come in, is like I, I had to get to a place of forgiveness and, and, and compassion for my mother so that I can tell her story mm. in a way that humanizes her. Because, mm. you know, it, it, this is our people. This is our people we're talking about. And we've been through... Horrific stuff, Karen Hunter. You know what I'm talking about. You look yeah, at all the stuff you have on your walls right behind you. You know what I'm talking about. As you're as you're as I'm reading um this ode to your mother, I'm thinking about my dad too. Mm. Um, because he was raised in, in Newark, but his family's from South Carolina in a very brutal home yeah. with a lot of poverty, rats rats and roaches and a lot of violence. And, yeah. you know, for him to come out of that to become all of the things that he ended up becoming, but it was complicated. And I think about growing up, never hearing that until he was sick, you know, and then he wanted to get real sensitive. I was like, but you raised now somebody that just you know, don't need to hear that now. So now we got, what we going to do emotions now? When, what is happening? You know? So that flip watching that when his own mortality was in front of him change him in a way that I was like, no, I love you. I was like, what, what yeah. is this? <laughs> for you um has right. your mother made that flip into that you know it's funny space of emotion? she every now and then i'll whoop me you know 
my mother and I, what I started doing years ago, probably in the last, in this century, at least, <laughs> I, my mother, you know, like a lot of black folks, she believes deeply in God. And so I'll just say, God bless you, mother. So that became my way of saying, I love you at the end of our phone calls or when I'm leaving her house in Jersey, God bless you. God bless you too. And every now and then she'll, you know, I'll say, I love you, mother. I love you too. It, every rarely <laughs> because who has loved her? Who's, who's loved her? You know what I mean? And, and it's just, it's hard, man. You know, and it's like you, you know, I, it's kind of connected, Karen, because you know I've been working on this Tupac book forever, ever. So that's the that's coming. It's coming, y'all. It is definitely coming. But it's been a deep dive. I've gone all the way back to ancient Africa through colonization, slavery, Middle Passage, you know, uh, uh, segregation, all of it. And the thing I keep thinking about, it is a miracle that Black people are here in this country, in the Caribbean, all over Latin America, Black folk, wherever we are on the planet, England. Toronto, Africa, given all that we've been through, and why would our mental health not be delicate given all that we survived? You know what I mean? So how do we, because I, I look at your mom in this book as a metaphor for the greater us, right? So yeah. you're telling a story, you're telling stories through this and it does read like songs in the key of life. There is, I feel, oh, I was like, and I'm not a poetry person because that's in touch with your emotions. I ain't really trying to do all of that. So I was like, <laughs> you know, I was like, what you trying to do, Kevin Bow? What is this? What is this? All right, I'm gonna have to stop reading because I ain't trying to be all, all mm. caught up like that. But mm. um that's probably why I've never really tapped into poetry because I'm like that requires you know something more than what I want to want to delve into at this point in time being transparent that said I respect that as as we as we navigate this thing called life you know what what is your coping mechanism besides you know because I was thinking about this as I'm putting together this plan mapping out this plan for 2023 for mm -hmm. this space that we're in right now I was like well, this is I've been on a 25 year journey you know it's like people people feel like oh you're overnight success or you you know things just happen even the process of writing I got to get back to and it's a process for me because I'm not a natural born gifted writer mm -hmm. uh as you are or many other people like I don't just sit down and bang things out it is for me very much uh, a technique it is very much you know repetition it is very much work it is work to write books for me so which means i have to put the work in to get the work out and i realize having been away from it i can't just get it's not like riding a bike i can't just jump back on and bang out 15 chapters in a in a week and you know like let's go i i used to but i you know that's when i was writing every day but what what is your process Ooh, well let me say this first and foremost. I think that um, everything, every way that we speak as a people is poetry. If you're from the Carolinas, it's Geechee Gullah. If you're from Jamaica, it's Patois. If you're from Haiti, it's, it's Creole. Uh, uh, if, you're, if you're a Black person from certain parts of the UK, it's Cockney, you know what I'm saying? And so I think that just the way we speak is poetry. When you're talking about your father, I imagined his South Carolina and North New Jersey accents coming together. I'm like that's poetry. And I think that I want to demystify it because it's like, you know, I love poetry. I was one of those kids who grew up loving, you know, before I knew there were black writers. <laughs> I love Shakespeare. I love Edgar Allan Poe's poetry, the sonnets of Shakespeare. I love Keats. I love Emily Dickinson. But when I discovered Sonia Sanchez and Mary Baraka and Langston and the poetry of Their Eyes of Watching God, which is fiction, but the way she wrote their eyes watching God is poetry, but then also our music. So you, Stevie Wonder, Nina Simone, that's poetry. Bob Marley's poetry, Fela's poetry. Billie Holiday is poetry. You know, the sisters talking in a hair salon, that's poetry. Uh, you know, the way folks are talking about TJ Holmes and Amy from ABC's Good Morning America, that's poetry. You feel what I'm is saying? Is it? Is that poetry? It's funny. <laughs> as hell. It's sad, but it's, it, we'll get to that. It's sad, but. Okay. The language that we're using to describe stuff, because we're we have a way with words as a as a people, and so I think all this poetry. Then my process, it, writing is hard. I don't just spit things. There's two ways that I write. One, sometimes stuff comes to me. Like the last poem in Grocery Chopping with my my mother is called Son to Mother, which is an inversion of Langston Hughes' famous poem Mother to My Mother to Son. I wrote that in two settings. Boom, it came out of me. This poem, the title poem, it took me a month or two to get it out of me. You know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. it was hard because I've now, I'm, I'm at a point now where I'm like, man, I pray that my mother lives a long life. I want to write a poem that's going to really honor her no matter how long or how short her life's going to be. I'm responsible for her. Literally, when your mama starts giving you the keys to the house and here's where I keep the money and here's the access to the bank accounts, 
and she's going to church more than ever because you know how black folks start saying well you know i don't know if i'm gonna be here that long you act like i'm gonna be here forever that has a devastating effect on you so my process is both organic when you write it right now sometimes i just literally have to think about like what do i want to say here that as you said it's not just about my mother but my mother mother is a metaphor for all of us and it's about all of our journeys you know what i'm saying because my mother mm -hmm. is your father my mother is your father your father is my mother so it's for both of them really well thank you um mother to son the last one um son to mother yeah can you read yeah. a little of that yeah um Okay. You talk about emotion. How come every time I come on the show, I get emotional? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a safe place. It's a safe place to to be all the things. I'm just gonna no read a judgment. couple of words. Son to mother. Mother, have I told you that you were the first woman I ever fell in love with? That what I've always wanted to hear in life, in life is to hear you say you love me too. That is why mine has taken me so long to write this poem. For how could I, a grown man, put words to paper if I'm that little boy, cowering beneath the power of that slap, the swing of that belt, or the slash and burn of that switch you used to beat me into fear and submission? And some folks, Ms. Hunter, would say, well, why you got to put all your business out there? Well, I do think that we have to talk about how we raise children and what's been passed along. And we seem to forget that we were beaten into submission and fear on those plantations and a lot of the stuff that happened on those plantations when our people were enslaved were passed like a baton and a relay race from generation to generation. And some of us who call ourselves Christians will quote the Bible and say, Spirit of God, spoil the child. But does it mean that you beat the child into fear and submission? You don't damage their self esteem. You don't damage their self worth. You teach them that they should feel shame if they do something wrong, but you don't break them down the way we were broken on those plantations. But if we don't know history, if we don't read, hashtag restudy travel. We don't know those things. We don't realize what we're doing to ourselves and to each other. And for me, something that Mary Baraka said is that poetry is making sense out of the chaos of the world. Sometimes the world is the poems that we live in. You feel me? Mm, yeah. I feel you. Yeah. And I feel with all of the, the pain and trauma that many of us are walking around with because we can't even have that conversation with our parents in the, in the sense that they would understand because after all, their parents and then their parents and their parents. So why would something I'm doing that my parents, parents, parents have done all the way back to the lash on that plantation without the understanding of what that is, that is not love, that is not love, it's submission. And it's submission to keep you alive and a submission to keep you alive and a submission to keep you alive, not to have you thrive. So how do you have that conversation? Have you had it with your mom? can't have it with my mother so I have it with myself that's why I write you know um I've tried boy I don't want to talk about that that's in the past I don't know what you're talking about you know it's a defensiveness you know because again if you don't have the 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 exposure to certain things you're not going to want to have those kind of conversations why are we bringing that stuff up you know or uh and I realized my you know my mother did the best that she could I would not be who I am if it wasn't for my mother, you know, I got my work ethic from my mother. I got my love of learning from my mother. I'm a writer because my mother, a storyteller because of my mother. Um, you know, um, I, I love the way we speak because of my mother. You know, I mean, all so many different things I can point to. I mean, my love of music came from my mother. My mother used to sing and sing Motown songs to me as a kid. And so it was like, I realized she was planting all kinds of seeds there. You know, my appreciation for history is because of my mother. So many different things. And, I, and even when I think about it, you know, and you know, we have a film coming out next year, Karen, that I'm directing about Black manhood, Black fatherhood. We have a number, number of brothers in the films, who, film who have father figures in their lives who said that Black women were equally responsible before them becoming men. Well, my mother was completely responsible for becoming the man that I am, you know, and so I have to acknowledge that stuff. So I think there's a way to talk about, I think it's not either or. In America, no matter what the race or identity of people or identities of people, it's an either or conversation. I love my mother unconditionally. I love her with compassion. I understand the context of who she is, you know, but I also say that here's some things that I want to keep that my mother gave me that I want to hold on to that are invaluable. And there's some things that I can't, I got to get rid of. Like I can't deal with the stuff that was destructive. You feel what I'm mm -hmm. saying? I can't carry that with me. I can't give that to my child. I can't give that to any more partners in my life. You know what I mean? I can't I can't do those things because we keep passing this stuff on. It's like, how are we gonna have conversations about white supremacy, about racism, about all the stuff that happens externally, but we're not willing to have conversations about the things internally that are a result of white supremacy that we take out on each other. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, well, physician heal thyself, right? Uh, and I, I feel like, you know, we can we have to do both things. We can't let anything go. But it's exhausting, you know. Mm-hmm. And at some point, you know, I'm going to lean into joy and happiness going into 2023. There's going to be a lot of happiness and joy uh, because I feel like we don't – we do it We do it as cover, not as, 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 as feeding the soul. You know, we do it as escape. You know, whether it's the strip clubs or the nightclubs and the parties, <laughs> the, you know, the drinking and the big car parties and all, you know, they're, they become escapes, not necessarily places where we lean in and actually find the pure essence of joy. What brings you joy right now, Kevin Powell? Well, what are you doing? Music. I, I, I mean, there's a lot of poems in my poetry book that are references to music. Uh, movies bring me joy. That's why I have a poem in there about Cindy Portier, our, our late great actor, and, and Cicely Tyson is a poem in there about her. Uh, sports. That's why I have a long poem about baseball in there. That's my great first great sports love. I had a therapist years ago, Karen, who said to me when I was in one of my many depressions, um, you know, remember the things that brought you joy as a child, bring that back into your adult life and keep it close to you. And when he said that, or she said that, or they said that, I can't remember who it was. um, I was like, music, sports, movies, like those things and reading. I just, I'm like, and I found I have found in my life if I don't have music happening for extended periods, and I definitely believe in being silent and meditating. I do that, but I'm like I gotta have sounds, I gotta have music, I gotta have my movies, my vintage movies. You know, it's just like I just saw Bamboozle the other day. I'm about to go see it's a Wonderful Life. It's like you know, again, <gasps> that's on my list. That's yeah. on my list. Yes, you know it's it's my like, top five. Yep, and it's okay to be happy. Like I think that we think especially those of us who are woke quote unquote that there's no space for being joy and I think like you know what you're opposed to if you if you say you're against all this other stuff well what is the world you want to build well to your point Karen that world should actually include joy if you feel like this world is miserable over here then the world that I'm trying to create the world that Karen Hunter has created your space it has to have joy and look at look you know look at I have Maya Angelou behind me I have art all around my walls you you have art and you have images of Ida B. Wells there I see Viola Davis behind you I see Janet Jackson behind you what brings me joy, man, watching Janet Jackson's video that included people like the Nicholas Brothers and, and, and Cab Calloway in the video. You know what I'm saying? I, mean, I sit on YouTube a lot just watching classic videos, movies. I'm just smiling away, man, because I'm like, I got to be happy. And I refuse to go a single day where I don't do something that makes me smile. Mm. That, no. Come on, Blueprint. Kevin Powell is here. Grocery Shopping with My Mother uh, is the book. I want to get into some stuff that's going on in the world and i want to talk to you about but let's go take jay in new york uh he's been holding on you're on the karen Hunter show with kevin powell welcome jay yes good afternoon to you and to kevin um nice to you. i heard kevin the last time he was on um i met kevin maybe 32 33 years ago wow. on a friday night at the New York City YMCA with a group of young people. He he knows oh what. Oh my God! You know, yes, I'm talking about. <laughs> let me let me just finish this, Kev. And the last time that I saw Kevin was on a Friday night at the Harriet Tubman Center. Uh, we was about to do a debate with Curtis Kurt- Lever and the elders shut us down. And let me say this to you, brother. I followed your career since that point on. We haven't seen each other or really interacted. I want to say this to you, brother, and with love and sincerity. The best thing you ever did in your life was go to therapy. Mm. Because from the time that I met you at that young age, brother, you, you, you was a beautiful brother, conscious brother, but you was an angry brother. <laughs> and we were all angry at that time because I guess whatever we were dealing with, but there was an intellect about you that was a little different than some of the other members of the group. And when I heard you talk about you went to therapy the last time you was on Carrie show, I said, man, that was the greatest thing that brother ever did for his life because it definitely made you and improved you into who you are today, man. And I'm so happy for your success. We have some political differences at this time, but man, let me tell you, you are a beautiful brother, man. And I really, really enjoy your growth and what you've done. And anybody who's listening to this program, therapy works. 
Tyler P. Works. Mm. Wow. All praise is due to God and our ancestors. Um, thank you. Um, I, uh, you know, it's funny, Karen, because I always tell people, uh, at my partner now, she, I said, she, I say to her all the time, if you would have seen me back and I was wild. I was yeah, you were, you were, you were angry. Was, <laughs> he was right. Well, I was, yeah. I was buck wild. It wasn't just, it was anger, but it was also, I was just wild. <laughs> you know, um, I how, was, much, how much is that as youth too, you know, cause you don't know what you don't know. And you know, I, I was slightly wild myself. Uh, not, not as wild as you I still, you know, but, but even that no judgment because we all like, you know, isn't this, we should grow up. I had the beauty to talk with, uh, Julie dash today. Oh, and, I oh my God, that. you know, I mean, but you know, and we were talking about this thing and I said, if you are the same in your forties, fifties, sixties, that you were in your twenties, something is inherently wrong. Like the, the goal is to grow, constantly yeah. grow, constantly challenge. So yes, therapy, but also you leaning into maturity to go to therapy was a choice. It wasn't something that you were mandated by the courts to have to do. You, you went well. to because you, well, no, no, but you know, but you know, you, you leaned into being a better version of yourself, which is what we should all be are striving for right we should well, all be striving for that one of the best because I, I am honest about everything I, I actually got kicked out of Rutgers and I was forced to go to therapy and uh to go back I never went back to school so I never got my degree but that therapy started me on a path of of, of self-discovery that was life-changing um and I continue to go to therapy and I think it's it's necessary in different forms I mean I'm looking for a new therapist actually because um I, I I got through I had an incredible therapist in 2020 when COVID hit to help me do a lot of stuff. But I think that it wasn't just therapy, it was also identifying elders that I could speak with and more importantly, listen to uh, and having some safe spaces with friends that that were non-judgmental. You know, I think that's important. People who are also trying to be healed. And I mean, the brother's talking about uh, uh, the period when I used to roll with Sister Soldier and there's a bunch of mm -hmm. us do something at the Harlem YMCA and rest in peace, Calvin Butts, Reverend Butts helped us get the space. When I think about it now, when he first became pastor at Abyssinian Baptist Church, I mean, we were young actors. We were trying to change the world. And think about that time he's talking about, it was the Central Park Five. It was Bensonhurst, it was Howard Beach, you know, for folks who are in New York, it was, those things were like George Floyd back, basically. It's just like, that it was the same stuff. It was right before LA Rebellion, Rodney King, all that kind of stuff that was happening. And, you know, and we were angry because of the Reagan Bush years. That's what it was, it was all those things. And so when I saw Black Lives Matter explode in 2020 and people, you know, were like these young people out in the streets, that's like, that's exactly what we were doing. I mean, why wouldn't they not be angry? Why they would not be angry? But um, I don't think there's anything wrong with anger. I think there's something wrong because we we're entitled as Black people, just like any other race of people to a full range of emotions. I just understand now there's proactive anger, which is let me channel that into my poetry, into my writing, into my activism, into my speeches, what or you, into the things that you're building uh, and community-wise, as opposed to, and, and proactive anger is about building something and, and destructive reactionary anger is just tearing down. And I had to learn a difference between the two, but I, I wanna say to people, we should be righteously angry, but then what are you gonna do with that? You know, or what are you turning it into? And I think that's the mm. brother's point, you know what I mean? Amen. Um, I just ordered my book, uh, cause it comes out tomorrow grocery no, shopping with my we're, mother we're, we're sending it to you i know so, uh, you sign in mine but i want to have one that people can okay. you know i'm building okay. a library in okay. real time okay. so this is the one people can put their fingers on Thank and you. you know that one that's mine that's my collector okay you know because you sign in it yeah i already told you i was gonna do that so okay. uh and and pre-order today because that is important right because yes order. uh going into tomorrow uh when you pub it's the pre-orders all of the pre-orders count yes, to the first yes. day they all land on the first day that's right. a little trick let's get this on the bestsellers list grocery shopping with my mother will you stick around Absolutely. you got time you got time Thank for me good Thank good because i got i want to ask you about Kyrie when we come back uh and and yeah. van lathan <laughs> said some things so i'm gonna come back with a van lathan clip 